So, welcome, gentlemen. Uh, good evening. We have uh, Cam, Vish, and Anurag. And um, I'll just set the stage in a few seconds. Um, we are here to discuss, as part of an experiment, our shared understanding and, more importantly, a dialogue around the first two lectures of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis by John Verveke. And uh, last time when we started discussing about how we will go about it, we had very simple set of expectations, which I want to summarize at the beginning of this uh, recording, which is uh, we would all go through one or two lectures independently, make our selective observations and notes, and then uh, without any preparation or advance exchange of uh, notes, we will use this live conversation to um, spark a dialogue and see how we can share our understanding, more importantly, listen to each other's perspective on that content, and hopefully draw some new connections that uh, we can't draw independently and alone. And uh, we hope this to be fun. This is not meant to be in any way uh, an authoritative uh, review or a complete review of uh, John Verkey's work, but more of uh, you know three people coming together who are deeply interested in the topic, and uh, as he would say, wrestling with the material together to hopefully come to a better understanding. Uh, anything either one of you want to add to the context of the discussion? Oh, that's a great opening. Thanks, Anu. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. That was good structure and summary. Good. So let me just kick off as uh, first lecture. And let me ask, uh, like, wish you first, like, what struck you? What are the notes you took away when you went back second time? Maybe let's just start with that. Okay, yeah, I'll start with one point, uh, and then I'm curious to see how both of you sort of approached it. The first time that I went through the, actually the first and possibly the second one too, I don't think I came away with a very clear understanding of exactly what the transition in the Upper Paleolithic actually was, right? Because, you know, Verveki talks about shamanism and sort of all of the things about the flow state that help you move into this state of enhanced cognition. And I think I got that, uh, but it wasn't clear how that actually translated into things changing. Um, but it was only on the second time around that it, it, it really made sense of, uh, I, I think the, the crucial element to me at least is, is that these shamans were kind of, he calls them generators of metaphor and basically giving new psycho technologies to all of the other hunter gatherers that these you know shamans were part of so because that was my doubt the first time which is it's fine and dandy for a handful of people to have the benefits of you know the ritual and the flow state and the enhanced cognition but how does that explain the culture and society as a whole change uh, and to me i think it was this missing element which is you actually only need a few people to look at things differently and be able to convince others of sort of the tools and you know psychotechnologies is where Vicky calls it uh, to then be able to absorb it like others don't need to be in that same state to be able to understand it when someone else explains it to them in the right way so that was a pretty big one for me because i think that also makes me hopeful about today in the sense that we don't really need to change everybody's mind we just need enough generators of metaphor in society today I think Michael is calling me back. Uh, I'll put you on mute, continue the conversation. I'll make sure I talk. Okay. I'm not going to continue the conversation. He can't cop out like that. I'm going to wait till he's done. <laughs> Fair then, Fair then, we, then we can finish. The, then we can continue the conversation. He's funny. I am totally on board with that. I really, I do really like your comments, though. You, you already sparked a couple things for me. I like that. I'm curious to hear what you have to say. Uh, so hopefully Michael's call means he's joining as well. Uh, and it's going to be a...
Hi, so uh, sorry to, for the interruption. Yeah. He is joining, which is fine. Continue, I think we'll just bring That's him great. in. That's great. Yeah, so uh, Cam, what were you saying? I didn't say anything. I was waiting for you to finish. I was like, there's no way that you get to bow. Okay, here we go. Okay, so let's see. What I got to put these on. So the, the things... So there were two things in what you said, Vish, that, that stood out for me. And one was the there's something central about the use of metaphor. I think you said that you only need a you you only need a few people generating metaphor. And that I'd like to yes. hear a little bit more about how you got that. Cause I the way I understood what he was saying about metaphor is, is that that's like humans cannot help but to as a human, you necessarily are a metaphor generator. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that was one thing, and then the other thing, uh, you I think you opened by saying you weren't sure what what did you did you say that it you weren't sure what caused the change in the upper upper paleo Paleolithic. Yeah, yeah, and, and now that I'm I'm actually uh, I I stopped driving, so maybe I can I can sort of explain. I, to me, the two uh, things that you said are interrelated so it started because my my first doubt was if only the shamans are going through this process of ritual and enhanced cognition through the flow state how is that sufficient to explain that the entire upper paleolithic society or culture or tribes all transitioned to the state where they were creating art where there wasn't art before or music or calendars or all of the other things that were making sort of points to as evidence of that transition okay so the I don't know that anybody really knows what the cause was. It's probably not one cause. Um, the things, the the most likely candidates. He talked about the the invention of alphabetic language, mm -hmm. which looks to. If I'm guessing, I'm guessing that that's probably one of the sink the, the the prime movers and and the it isn't necessarily on a positive note either in the sense that you have shaman bringing everybody along it's more along the lines of the administrator who can now now i have a hyper efficient manner of um communicating things like battle plans across time and space so i become a way more powerful predator once I have alphabetic language. So it isn't, I can, I can cause everybody else an awful lot of pain as a consequence of that and probably will, you know, if you, you if you give me a little bit of power, I'm just going to keep taking probably. So the, so the drive, then the response, the evolutionary response is, well, how do we, how do we contend with this now? So then you get a whole bunch of, um, new things like it's new problems to solve that everybody has to solve and it's an existential threat so there's a height there's a heavy duty evolutionary impetus to change the way that you think about life itself that's kind of that. the, the way that i connected it to the second point i was making is that i think verbeki is also right about the fact that even though there were a couple of things that everybody was sort of figuring out, including probably simple weapons and, you know, sp spoken language. I think the, I guess the, the different ways of looking at the world that, you know, the ritual and flow states induced in the shamans allowed them to metaphorically explain those ways of looking at the world to everybody else around them. Mm -hmm. I, I think he gave the example of projectile weapons, which the Neanderthals did not have and which I think Homo sapiens developed at, at around that time, or you know, using carvings on a yeah. on a bone to look at the phases of the moon, right? And all it took was a shaman to make that connection in in that enhanced state. But once he did, he was able to explain it to everybody else, and they got it, and they were able to take advantage of that. So, to me, it it also sort of made sense that as long as there are a handful of people or some critical threshold of people in society that are able to bring these different ways of looking at things and, mm -hmm. you know, correct their implicit learning to be more accurate than everybody else, 
it's still going to be enough to change the trajectory of that society. Um, that was the hope that you were talking yeah. about. So yeah. I, I saw, I'll let me build on what Vish and Cam are saying because I saw some connections that were made out very explicitly in that lecture. Um, to First of all, I think he calls out that during Upper Paleolithic era, by the way, the literacy piece came much later. In that time, just the idea of making art, music, time tracking, etc., came out. And I think that was tied to rapid development of frontal cortex. Mm -hmm. and some sort of near survival of an extinction event that happened where uh, the human population, Homo sapiens, went through a very small, tight survival and only a few thousand left were survived and they came out. And as one of that, there's a lot of work around why frontal cortex um, became larger for Homo sapiens after that survival near extinction event. So I think that explains why there wasn't art, music, time tracking before Upper Paleolithic, and it came after when the frontal cortex had grown. And also, I think that's when development of rituals and this idea of mind sight, that you could look at your inner mind and have some imagination started becoming clear. And that's where he talks about exact uh, expectation. Ex I'm bad with pronunciation. Exaptation. Exactly, expectation mechanism that uses. So the fact that, you know, there was this process that you could alter your state through sleep deprivation. So he's very clear about how shaman works. Shaman, shaman works mm -hmm. by sleep deprivation, uh, you know, natural, natural drugs like mushrooms, and perhaps putting yourself in a trance by spinning, by mm. drum beating, singing. Drum, singing. So I think there were physical and natural drugs that allowed people to alter their mental state. And shamans probably were seen as, quote unquote, few experts who could lead people through that state. Mm -hmm. right? So yeah. I think that ties back to what Vish was saying, that they were, they were, became the guides, literally, um, I think, uh, for that. And that's allowed, and whether they were themselves reaching altered state, or they were helping other people in the community reach altered state through sleep deprivation, spinning, dancing. The point being that the altered state is what allowed them to reframe and get a new insight into a struggle they might be having, uh, a fear or a new problem they were trying to solve, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and that's the kind of thesis he sets out, that this was the first experiments with humans actively trying to reach an altered state to change their the frame, you know, their frame of 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 how they attend to reality, yeah. right? So, because he says it's not enough, belief isn't the key, right? That's exactly right. it's how you, yeah. And also, I mean, what I understood. Are we talking just about se session one or two? Or are you session guys... one right now? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah we it's all, uh... we all agreed that we will talk about session one and two today. That's okay. Good. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That's um. But the other thing that he doesn't say, but it's also in the science, is that. Uh, certain kinds of stress or or challenge will um, create different expressions in genes, right? So the genetic code itself isn't the issue. It's it's what the pressures are, and those pressures can create different expressions depending on what's demanded. And of course, the more the more crisis oriented the demand, the more likely you're going to have a shift in genetic expression. Um, that's something he doesn't talk about, but it's something that I've I've studied. And, and understood for a while now. Um, it's why things like ice baths work, because what you're doing is you're demanding a different expression from the genes. And if you and that's a disruptive strategy too. Ice baths is it's another disrupt. You know, it's a psychotechnology. But yeah, that's. Um, I think that's part of why he said even the pressure to survive forced us to be social in a way that we had not been previously. Yeah. Because it was necessary, and then we we could you know develop the social networks as as a necessity of survival, which we didn't need before apparently or not as much. And I enjoyed the connection of like the he introduces the idea of rituals as ability to read strangers' mind. So right, mind sight. Uh, right, uh, mind sight as uh, the first steps of distributed cognition, which I thought was interesting. Like. Mm -hmm. If you can do it two ways, if you can both listen to strangers and try to read their intentions um, and have rituals that 
kind of guide through that uh, uh, through mechanisms of procedure, then I think it's interesting that uh, you can have distributed cognition be the, like you can sit around the fire camp and have a shared view. You know, the, the other thing he talked about, and I took notes, uh, this is really great we're doing this, by the way, because I get a lot more out of this than I would have otherwise. Um, he said that the psychotechnologies that the shamans developed altered consciousness to enhance adaptability. Um, and it's not a result of biological evolution, but more cognitive software changes is what he said. And then the human brain networking uh, was enhanced to writing. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Back up and say that again, please. Oh, from the very beginning? Well, no, the bit about. Oh, that it's not but a biological. Last, last point you made. It's, it's not, not a, biological. a biological, but it's somehow. So that doesn't make sense to me. If that so makes he, sense to you guys, please, please help me understand that. Well, like how, this, how, how is cognition not biologically well, mediated? Well, in other words, the structure of the brain didn't change fundamentally what changed is the wiring of the brain itself so in other words it's not like the brain got bigger or smaller or that we added extra sections is that the way it was wired changed so it's um that's what he's claiming okay so it's still biological in the sense that it's still a brain it's it's cool. a different configuration of the brain yeah, yeah i but really not... i got i i think i'm i might be wrong about this but the the analogs to software the, the analogs to, to machines is problematic for yeah, me. I, me too. I, I agree. That's actually mm -hmm. something that Miguel Chris harps on a lot. He says it's yeah. not a good metaphor. Yeah. yeah. Because I, it, it's not but, it's not really how it works. But yeah, I, I, I agree. Coming coming to, he does reframe it as without getting into any metaphor, he actually literally says through the process of let's say shaman going through what we can call trans, meaning um, induced trans you are able to reframe your perspective mm -hmm. on a problem that you're struggling with that you might not, if you were to quote unquote, sit down and try to change your belief. That's right. Or, or, or rationally try to step through it logically. And so the belief over here is that, the, that we are literally working themselves or ourselves into a new state so that we can get a new insight into how to go for a hunt or how to solve mm -hmm. a social problem or how to you know, solve uh, whether to go move to another campsite or not, whatever the problems might be of the tribe. Uh, it's coming through that process, which is not a belief based, but yet offers um, an insight, um, a reframing on the problem. Yeah, way so of can, I, can I ask you guys how much you actually personally experience that occurring in your own lives? Quite a bit for me. Yeah, a lot. Especially do, you, is, do you find it disconcerting? Oh, at first, it's very disruptive. So I think that one of the reasons it's not a very popular process is because it's very anxiety producing. Because what you have is, my experience is that when you have a, um, what does he call it? Um, not insight, but like, what is he? Let me look at my notes. He, He's talking well, later. you're looking at your notes, Vish, let me just quickly get a temperature check from Vish and Anu on that as well. Like what, how, how much do you experience that? So, on a daily basis in your own life right now, do you feel? So, Vish, you go first. No, go for it. I don't know. I feel like you had something on the tip of your tongue. So, I'm, I have been so much belief-oriented that only in the last few decades I have started consciously suppressing, if I can, what my belief is going to be versus what I'm experiencing and trying to go with the internal state of experience. I've not had enough of these experiences but I'm very curious that if I were to go to a shamanic camp today, what kind of insight I would have uh, through this process. Uh, I can tell you my 20 year old was very skeptical. My 40 year old was less skeptical. My, <laughs> my 60 year old says, I'm sure there's something there. I <laughs> see, that's a really good answer. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, Wish. My experience has been that, I mean, at least, Cam, I feel like you're asking about frame changes that are pretty major because I think minor ones probably happen to you a lot of the time and they're not disconcerting. Uh, like to give you an example, every time you study a new concept in, I uh, used to pick a random example, physics, I think there's there's this categorization or 
bucketing that we do, right? Oh, these are metals, these are non-metals. And to me, that itself is a kind of framing. It's a way of distinguishing things in the world around us that isn't, you know. <laughs> Not random. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah see? Uh, but it, as far as the major ones go, I have to agree with Michael. They are very disconcerting when they happen. It feels like, it feels like a part of you is kind of going away as a result mm -hmm. of that. Uh, and it has happened only infrequently uh, and maybe more off late than in the first few years of my life. Uh, but it has happened and it has changed kind of the way that I view the world as a result. Uh, my okay. guess of those is usually those happen when there's a significant emotional upheaval and your cognitive frameworks are not working for you. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> and it's like, you know, you can choose your top emotional upheavals um, and you know, when you like you, when you experience near death, or you experience death of a loved one, family, mm. or you experience a true crisis of identity, or where you're not sure about a path to take, left or right, uh, maybe you even have a significant job loss or something like that, career mm. setback that you were not expecting. <laughs> I think all, all those uh, deep ego blows, right, it could force you to reframe your belief system. I, I mean, force you to come up with a new way of thinking that is not tied to your belief system. Uh, but um, it's not easy. Cam, can I ask you why you asked the question? Is it because you wanted to know if it was disconcerting or if you wanted to know that it happened at all? Well, so I, oh, I know it happens. And I'm, I'm, I'm fairly disconcerted quite frequently. And that's really what's prompting the, the question. So I was, Michael, I got a little bit of a glimmer of hope, I think, when you said in the beginning, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, you're, because I, so I don't want to derail this particular conversation. I want to get through these, the topics, but just since since i'm talking about it i'll just give you guys a little bit of a, a sense of where i'm at and what's going on so the michael you've mentioned the ice baths that is something that my brother turned me on to several years ago and i poo-pooed it in the beginning he said just try it mm -hmm. just give it an honest try so i've been at that diligently incrementally getting to the point where now Every morning I'm doing that. He turned me on to Wim Hof's method. Mm -hmm. I've been That's doing I that. I spend an hour, generally an hour to an hour and a half. As soon as I wake up, before I get out of bed, doing the, that breathing. Mm -hmm. And then when I get out of bed, I have a creek in my backyard. It's running about somewhere between 50 and 55 degrees. There you go. So I go get in that and lay in that for about five minutes. Nice. And then there's, so then I, then I go and I sit and I have, you know, 12, 24 ounces of coffee and free write for about an hour. And then I go into my day and I am just, it, it is disconcerting going through my day. It's not necessarily negative, but it is not normal is how well, it feels. Yeah. I mean, here's, here's how I've experienced it is that, and this is my understanding of the nervous system, generally speaking, any shift in function is disconcerting or frame, right? Does it because we are creatures? That's that, what Vish was saying about yeah. you're getting the, you're getting little ones all of the time when you're when you're learning. But when you yeah. have a big one, like when I as I came out of my traumatic activation, which was you know very dominant for most of my life, it was you know I would feel calm and it would be really disconcerting because I was used to being in fight flight most of the time, yeah. and it was like God, I felt like I wanted to climb out of my skin. I was like, what the hell is this? You know, and, and in the beginning, I couldn't tolerate it for very long. So I would have to go back to drama or or stimulation. And then then, I, you know, as I've gone along, I have more and more tolerance for it. And OK, um, so so we I, don't so you and I don't derail it. So you and I should probably spend some time one on one. Um, yeah. But if I can, if I can mildly push back on that, Cam, I, you know, I, I think obviously there's this surface layer motive of going through sort of the letter of what Rebecca is talking about. But uh, again, what I'm hoping to get out of this is kind of what you guys are doing right now, which is tying it back to your lives in the ways reality, that makes right? sense. Yeah. yeah this is what I want. Yeah. Because that's the same here is like, I'm really excited about us and also the material because I, I, I'm familiar with much of what Reiki is saying because I've been doing it. 
but I'm, you know, I'm really excited about the verbiage and the, and his framing. And I'm sure he's going to teach me new ways to approach and to understand it and to apply it, which is really what I want. I want to be able to apply it more effectively um, because of, you know, I've already, I mean, I've had a lot of major shifts in my life. Betrayals, that's that's one that's tough. I've had a number of betrayals that have been massively disruptive and that just shatters your world. And and um, and now in the end, that, that was a reframing because it's a disruptive experience. That eventually was helpful, but got it. That took years sometimes. Um, but you know, I think I really love McGillchrist's frame because what he explains is that it's not what you do or say; it's how you attend to what you do or say. Yeah. In other words, where are you coming from? Uh, what orientation are you coming from? Is the issue. That's why when people ask him, "What what should I do to be more right brain, brain dominant?" Which well, means- so to use to layer Verveke's language, I really like how Verveke will say foregrounding. What's that? So what, the, what's foregrounding? So uh, yes. Vermeke's talking yes. about the different functions of the brain, and, and he does. Oh, he, okay. he, he makes the point over and over again, like it's all it's always all happening, right? So when you say where you're coming from, yep. Well, in fact, I'm coming from all of those places, neurologically speaking, all of the time. Where Vermeke's language is helpful is he'll say what is foreground. Okay, that's so as well, that's, in what which of the is it is what I'm is the activity that I'm engaged in right now left hemispherically right predominantly left hemispherically mediated which we are right now speaking using language manipulating the word you know that's Mm -hmm. the manipulative highly rational Mm -hmm. thing or is it more am I doing am I participating in something more right hemispherically mediated and then the other uh Jill Bolte Taylor's got some pop cultures level stuff that that actually does a really good job of talking about the what the it's the four so it's it's the mm-hmm. frontal and mm-hmm. it's the frontal and the left frontal and back and left and right yep so those and all four of those are present all of the time and active but again that sorry i'm sorry to be so pedantic but no the, but the, it, it, the whatever foregrounding, the verveki he talks a lot about the, the relevance Yep. what is relevant another that's kind of another way of saying what is foregrounded right now or even when mcgillgris says what what's the master and what's the emissary so so what in a you know what's the dominant he says left or right right brain dominance mean your brain's still working and you're still being firing the whole way except there is a guide there's an overreaching guide in either sense so you and the problem with left brain is that it's unaware of what it doesn't know so it's very narrow-minded and very stuck and very uh, sure of itself and very uh, has to be to do what yeah, it's for exactly but then if that's a dominant then of course you lose perspective and you and you can't change actually you you're stuck yes for right brain you know it's like overview 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 and then the the emissary gets details that it can re in, in re in, um what do you call it re in, um integrate into the whole um and that's the way the rhythm is optimal so and that's, you know, I've experienced that very profoundly when I've come out of trauma uh, activation, because when you're in states of survival, you're, you're, I believe that's actually left brain dominance predominantly, by the way, after I've read all of um, Miguel Chris's work, I'm pretty convinced that right, right, left brain dominance is trauma. It's the same thing. Um, and mm. because you're so stuck, I mean, your perception, right? I mean, you know, the world is dangerous and I can't trust people. And it doesn't matter what they do or what the evidence is. It's always the same that, you know, I'm not safe. I'm not safe. I'm not safe. And then when you come out of that, you're like, and then, of course, one of the disruptive parts of it is you have to realize how wrong you were. For, yeah. And, yeah. Right? So we'll get it. He, yeah. Verveke does a really nice job of it on the bit. It's so it's a number of episodes down the line here where he gets into the was he he talks about the spiral the parasitic processing or it it goes either way it's an upward out spiral and a Mm -hmm. downward it's the same thing it's a matter of which direction are you moving in a given moment because you can say stuck or you can say resolute because i need to be resolute to do certain work absolutely i mean it's just a matter of where it's applied and and who what the guiding principle is right that's it's it's nothing wrong with being left brain using your left brain it's just that what for right if you're using the left brain in in place of the of the overview, it's it's doesn't have the capacity for that, yeah. and that's what we're looking at in the modern world, right? So, 
And that's part of, I mean, the meaning crisis. I don't, you know, if you look at their works and they actually have some interviews too that are worth listening to the two of them. Um, it's pretty obvious that they're on the same page fundamentally. I think that the, the thing that Verbeke has that's different is he's actually drilling down to the specific ways in which to achieve what Miguel Chris says we need to do. And that's what I'm really excited about. Yeah, McGill, yeah, Verbeke, Verbeke, I think, has got his eye on exactly what the four of us are doing right now. Mm -hmm. he, he is the, the reason, I suppose, that the reason that his language goes to things like mechanical metaphors, because we're using machines to do this. And he's like, this is how we get out of this. Like the the app, you actually have to use this technology. This is the this is the next version of what happened in the probably in the Upper Paleolithic. Like the mm -hmm. the technological mm -hmm. mediation allows for what occurs to me is is the again. Uh, thank you for the corrective on you on the on the time frame difference between the invention of literacy, which mm -hmm. I, when you said that I was like, oh yeah. You guys were talking about the art, which is probably about 10,000 years before the alphabet. Yeah. Nonetheless, the alphabet comes along probably as yeah. a consequence of that earlier event, mm -hmm. in, part, in large part, not, not solely causal. But the thing that occurs to me with the alphabetical mediation, that is a compression. It allows for a compression of information. So we're literally doing this at approximately the speed of light right now. So the frame rate on what the frame rate for that resonance to occur is not the frame rate of write it down on a piece of parchment and put it in a leather satchel and put it in a sailing vessel to send over to the other side of the Mediterranean. It's I'm sitting in North Bend, Upper Snoqualmie Valley in the state of Washington, and, and you're in California. That's Live. right. Video, and, video conferencing is one hell of a psychotechnology. No it doubt. sure is, man. Right? That's... And uh, the, the level of uh, high fidelity interaction we can have. And we're not even, like, of course, it's still not perfect, but versus where we were even in 25 years ago, it's like radically different That's experiences. Nice. We can have four people in four different rooms sitting. Um, I want to come back to his second lecture, because there were two or three things I found, and I'll float those as points of discussion. And in the second lecture, I think what he does, which I found really interesting, is he connects two or three very profound and different ideas, which I had independently read, but I had never connected them the way Verwicki did. For example, uh, Mihai Chikson Mihai had done all the work on flow. He's from University of Chicago. I'd read his work on flow states, and it's a beautiful work around how you know we can reach a flow state where time stops and you do lose sense of and and the whole framework of the two by two he has around anxiety and boredom and how you reach a flow state that was well established independently for now 25 years in fact i think he died only recently a year or two ago that's right yeah it's very recently right and then there wow. is a second body of work which is on metaphor that the book by uh, Meta uh, we live metaphors we live by by lukio Again, something I had discovered as part of my marketing background, where you re realize that metaphors is a very powerful way of actually persuading anybody on anything and how deeply metaphors is. You can't get away from metaphors. Everything is, our physical actions are metaphors. And the third thing is all implicit learning things, right? And what Reiki does is how he combines these three ideas saying, you know, um, flow state actually is no different than or similar to uh, implicit learning states where we are making connections uh, very simply similar to that. And metaphors are the tools by which we make some of these lateral connections that cannot be made uh, deductively, so to speak. And I thought that was a brilliant summation of two or three ideas uh, coming together. Uh, and uh, that was, to me, the highlight of that episode. I, I agree 100%. I, I was really intrigued, too, by what I thought I heard him say is that you can actually train your subconscious to catch patterns accurately or more accurately so that you don't end up believing in bullshit, basically, right? So you, it's a bullshit detector if it's trained properly. This is what he was, and I, this is something that I have thought of on my own in regards to polyvagal theory, which I believe that if you, if you learn how to tone your nervous system properly, it will be adaptively responsive automatically instead of you having to try to think through everything which doesn't work anyway and um 
I mean, that's what I think Polybagel says in part, which is that people that are well-regulated don't have to work so hard at being successful at life because the responses are accurately adapted to the situation more often, and therefore they don't end up in trouble more often. Where if someone's really dysregulated, which I don't think is any different than a meaning crisis, by the way, yeah. then you're lost because your, your, your sorting system doesn't work. You start, you know, you start believing that, you know, if I have a bigger wedding, my 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 wedding, my uh, marriage will last longer instead of the reason, you know, the reason he explained, which is that you, you, people tend to have a bigger wedding when they have more resources, <laughs> like, you know, both social. Well, so, and, so, yeah, there was a one thing that really stood out this time through it in in relation to that was when he he makes the point, he gives the he walks through in excruciating detail the experimental design around the what they determined for around implicit learning right. yeah. and then he makes the point that if you start to tell the subjects to try to to to, to explicitly mm -hmm. try to notice the patterns their performance goes down yeah that's right uh, you, you, your your uh, belief systems come in the way <laughs> you call, it's yeah. a great, your machine comes to a halt and uh, in the um, the matter of things, McGilchrist goes into this very at length, um, where he says that you know, or maybe it's in uh, Master and His Emissary, but he goes, he has a huge chapter about this because he's like, everyone that's good at anything, if you really talk, watch them and talk to them, they none of them know how they know what they know, and every time they try to explain it, it, it the performance plummets. So it's it's really funny, isn't it? And again, that's because the left brain isn't, that's not what it's made for. Yeah. It's yeah. not made for that processing. And and when, Which, you, when you inject it, it fucks everything up because it's so what? So are we in deep peril here trying to do this? No, because that's, he's, he's, his whole point is to train the implicit system to, to be able to use disruptive strategies as a way of being able to make sure that what you're believing and seeing isn't totally wacky. Um, I know, but isn't what we're doing right now. I don't think so Not because, I mean, I I think that even though we're you don't don't want to think that just because we're being left brain communicators right now that what we're doing is completely devoid of intuitive or implicit elements. Okay, I, I, that's what I, because you know, speech was not like the failure of the intuitive. Yeah. It's just another technology, and of course we're going to have to embody this in our lives. But you know, I've discovered. By reading McGilchrist, by listening to Jordan Peterson, by um, even Verveke so far, and even the course we took together, those have altered how I respond to my life in a better way. I mean, you're talking the, about EMT when you say the course we took together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. EMT. Okay. Um, the the these so far. I mean, I've been actually surprised how much um uh, Miguel Christ and Joe and Peterson uh, particularly in the last three years have altered how I live and it's been so helpful like I'm really a fucking blown away because my my explicit mind has some sort of guideline that's better than it used to be ah. and so when I when something comes up I'm like well explicitly I know that Miguel Chris said or Peterson oh. gave a guideline, like one of Peterson's guidelines that I use all the time now, I think is absolutely genius. He says, when you're upset and dysregulated, like if you're resentful or angry or, uh, or you feel like a victim, you have to ask yourself these two questions. Do I have to stand up for myself or do I have to grow up? And that has been unbelievably helpful in my relationship because I, I realized in some ways I wasn't growing up. I was being a baby and I was demanding, you know, I was like, and then I finally faced it. I was, you know, then I did, you know, I did the ice bath and I did breath work and I did meditation. I did, you know, write, creative writing. And I was able to shift. That was a shift recently and recognize, wow, I'm such a fucking jerk. Like I'm, I'm acting like a fucking five-year-old with her. No wonder she's not reacting to me in the way I want. Right. <laughs> like, duh. And then when I shifted, she shifted. And so it worked. It was real. And it was a combination of the two, you know, body sensations, well, right? Dreams, uh, intuitive senses of where to go and what to do. But it was also informed by, because I think this is what he'll teach us, I'm, I'm guessing, is that, you know, you want to use your frontal cortex and your intuitive together to make sure that the, that one of the other isn't wrong, right? You, you, it, the, there's a way to use them both together. It's not a competition. It's not a war. 
It's actually a, a, a covenant between your conscious mind and your intuitive body system that I think brings out the best in everybody. That's my that's my interpretation of. Uh, I want to add to that, and and maybe Cam, hopefully, directly address the incongruence you were kind of pointing out, which is like, hey, people's performance get worse when they talk about why something is the way that it is. Uh, and I think, at least to me, there is a difference between trying to justify why a metaphor works and talking about a metaphor that works, mm -hmm. right? Or a framing that works. Mm -hmm. So as long as we try not to delve too deeply into why does this metaphor work and like why does this behave the way that it does, just that this metaphor is useful, this framing is useful. I think that is the balance that, that sort of Michael's also talking about, uh, oh. where you want to use the flow state to uncover these new ways of looking at the world and then share that uh, in sort of a more left brain dialogue uh, to, to, to sort of share the benefits of that metaphor to others. Uh, and I wanted to connect it to something else which actually stood out to me in, in the second lecture, which isn't from the second lecture at all. It's actually from something that Rafe was talking about at the end of day two of EMP, right? Where he's saying, you know, there are so many parkour experts he knows who wouldn't stand up to their spouses, right? Yes. Or martial That's arts awesome. experts who, yes. you know, stay in all of these like negative ways that they're unable to take the frames that they developed in one area and embody that in the rest of their lives. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, and I think it is exactly this piece. It is, am I consciously reflecting on the things that I came across in the flow state and seeing where else it may apply or just letting it sort of simmer in that domain and not nowhere outside of it? That's very helpful. Thank you. Plus, there's also such thing as negative flow states, too. Yeah. Yes. That's that's another thing to recognize. So just because you're in the flow doesn't mean you're in the right place because you can flow with porn, you can flow with video games, but you're not actually engaging in life in a meaningful way because you're you're leaving out a part that's essential, right? The body part of, yeah. of being with someone or playing with other people or, you know, parkouring instead of boom, 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 boom on your, you know, in your little joystick. Um, that was really well said, Vish, by the way. I, I really like what you what you just put together there. That was really helpful. I, uh... It helped me a lot when I sort of made that connection. I, again, it's part of this is is thanks to the conversation we're having here, right? Like, I don't think I would have pieced it together quite this way. So there was a interesting connection I found, which is not in the second lecture, but came from outside. Um, the flow state, he very clearly technically defines it as where you are getting clear information and you have tightly coupled feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And the tightly coupled feedback loop allows you to do error correction. Right. Right. Those three things are like the literally the technical definition of what allows flow state to happen and sustain. Also, failure matters. You got to remember that part. Failure matters. Exactly. Yeah. And therefore, error correction can happen. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he obviously talks about that as also the key mechanism for implicit learning, where implicit learning is good versus implicit learning is just simply some patterns firing because of correlation, but is actually not correct, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but here is the piece that I found very interesting. I was reading about a few months ago, Karl Popper. And Who? Karl Popper. Karl Popper. Karl Popper? He, yeah. Karl, K-A-R-L. Those who are reading physics, uh, you cannot read sciences without re reading Karl Popper. He, mm. he's, the, he's the giant in um, study of knowledge. And, and philosophy. He's the one who came up with this idea of falsifiability of a theory, et cetera. Right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's science fiction. Um, anyway, so what's interesting about Karl Popper is that he is clearly the giant in philosophy of science. Uh, by some measures, probably the biggest uh, epistemologist who studied how science works and how knowledge is created. And he's the best explainer of scientific scientific enlightenment methodology that allowed us to have the flourishing of last 500 years. Why do I bring that up? Because his key thesis is all around how science work is to, works is through uh, insights, hypothesis, experiments, and error correction. 
Mm -hmm. Right. Is exactly the same process as flow, mm -hmm. which is exactly the same process as tacit learning. But now run through the left brain. Now run with the slow thinking, with the formal thinking, with design of experiments, with the processes that allow self-correction to happen through random control, double bind trials, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's fascinating because to me that, I don't know whether Verveki covers that, but I think uh, because Verveki covers so much of Cog Cogsci, uh, I think that's a very interesting parallel in some future work if we ever do offshoots on AI and others. Uh, yeah. The guy who has the most to say is uh, Popper. That's real. Thank you for that tip because I, I find that um, part of living a good life is actually living your life through that structure, right? So you're you're constantly sorting and reconsidering and having a way to measure, right? Because you have to be able to measure somehow in a meaningful way so that you can you measure progress towards something desirable, right? And that, that's actually one of the things that Peterson talks about, he, he harps on this constantly, is that positive emotion comes almost exclusively from the perception of moving towards a valued goal steadily, right? And he says, achieving the goal doesn't do a thing for you. It's temporary. It's, it's constantly having a, a meaningful goal to shoot for and move towards. And I think that, that the only way you can know if you're succeeding is if you have a measurement that is actually tied to reality, right? Otherwise you're gonna end up in a ditch somewhere, right? So you, you need you need this to be a functional, me, meaning-oriented human, right? Because the hierarchy of, of choice is part of the meaning, right? That says, what's most meaningful? Do I snort Coke and go to whores or do I go home and take care of my family? Well, if you have a meaning hierarchy and if yeah. you have a way of sorting what's good or not, then and you have a target, then you're able to decide, oh, okay, cocaine and whores is not a great idea. I'm going to go home instead. And then, of course, over time, you have a better and better life. And you and of course, he talks about how the goal is to is to alleviate suffering and to admit that we uh, can actually cause suffering to ourselves and others in the world if we don't attend to things in a better way, which he's trying to teach us. Right. Is that is that what you guys heard, too, in lecture two? Something like that. Yeah. 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 I, I maybe and to, to tie what you're saying and what Anu was saying, I think uh, Anu, to me, the scientific method, I would call that explicit learning, even though it has the same conditions as you know what implicit I guess good implicit learning as Barbeki defines it is. Exactly. Uh, no, uh, my point was actually to Cam that that the mechanisms of self-deception that we have to overcome. Um, are same whether we are doing implicit learning or we are doing explicit learning all the way down to scientific experiments that are going to send a man to the moon, right? Yeah, that's, fundamentally that's, they are, you're so, right. So, so what, what Karl Popper is saying is your methods of knowledge creation, uh, your theories of science have to be error correcting and he makes a big deal about it. Just like, and it all comes back to Verveke's idea of don't bullshit yourself and mm -hmm. self-correction in every way. So my simply point being that both mechanisms, the explicit and implicit, at some deep level, have to have error correction and flow from the same stuff. One is psychological, emotional, intuitive, perhaps. Other is explicit, rational, mm -hmm. left brain, and organized by 500 years of uh, enlightenment theory around how to progress knowledge. Yeah, I, I used to have this doubt when I... Um... Although I it wasn't using the the vocabulary here, right? There's all of the self help lit, self help literature around being in the moment and being present to the moment, right? And and I always used to have this doubt, like, well, if I'm always in the moment, when am I going to decide what it is that I do and plan for things and actually like intentionally move towards something? Uh, and yeah. then, and then it, it was sort of, I think, in a couple of places, including here, where it's like, I think it's that balance of. I think I know what you were saying, which is you need to have this high level awareness, this strategic view that's more left brain and sort of concrete and explicit, and you sort of falsify what you want to try and measure. Uh, but then you selectively choose to go into these flow states or implicit learning modalities where you're sort of moving towards the things that you want to do.
Well, there's, I think there's another layer to this too, which is that if you are, in, if you're able to be present with yourself and you ask yourself the question, what yes. direction should I go? Then your intuition points and then your implicit mind, I mean, explicit mind then plans, right? So that this is the, I think the the more functional. Even if it doesn't plan, it's paying attention and it makes note of whether yeah. the intuition was right after the fact or not. Yeah, exactly. That's right. And then right. then if it decides it is, then it gets busy figuring out how to go there in all the ways that it's good at figuring out, like you know timelines and budget and and who's going to go with me or whatever it is, you know, you know whatever the, your thing that you're going towards is, or you know I'm going to work out more. Or whatever and then you say well how am i going to do that and how am i going to afford it and what time am i going to do it and again you can keep going back to intuitive for a, for a sense check and then you come to explicit and you can even check my intuition says this i'm not sure let me kind of figure it out and put some charts up and track myself and they'll go wait a minute i'm lying to myself I, you know, I keep thinking i'm feeling this way and that i am dedicated but i'm not because when i track it on a sheet I see that I do it twice a week when I thought I was doing it five times a week. I mean, this is this is the great value of of putting them in their right place. I think that's part of what he's trying to teach us too. Is and this is what Miguel Crest and also Peterson talk about is don't try to have the part of yourself that sucks at something do that thing. You know, don't don't try to put the left brain where it doesn't belong because it's horrible. At, at overview it can't do it and it's it's not very wise it's actually really narrow-minded and pig-headed so you have to back off and have access to the intuitive so that you can then that's your navigation is the intuitive plus the explicit so you have to have both because they handle different parts and and i think that's part of what's wrong with the modern world is people they're using their left brain for the wrong thing and then they think it's the right thing. And then they get all righteous about it. And I'm right. And, you know, oh my God, it's like, come on. So that's that's how I've framed it for a while. I'll ask a last question. I'm mindful of the time. It's nine o'clock. Maybe Nick, if you can stay over five, 10 minutes. I, can I have a hard stop at nine. So okay. I might need to drop off. No worries. No worries. Yeah, because you got I want others. You can sit. duties. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, yeah. So I, I recently switched to working for a startup that's mostly based out of India. Oh, uh, yeah. And and so this is morning time and I have meetings. Of course. So oh, I have I to see. jump to, okay. to work what meetings. What a delight yeah. for you to join us. Uh, we will. Uh, we have something scheduled next week. Also, Michael, same time. It's on yep. your calendar. I have it on my calendar. And um, do you want to wrap up or do you want to continue for a few minutes? I'll just take a poll. I can I can hang out a little longer. I know it's a little late, which I, I regretted. <laughs> How about you, Cam? I don't, I don't want to leave this out. I would wrap it up. Okay. That's, that's yeah. fine with me, too. Thank you, Cam. I, I'm okay, by the way, if you guys continue, but but I really appreciate that, Cam. Okay. We, I'm recording okay. this, and I'll be sending the recording. Okay. That's so, true. So he can share so it with Vish anyway, right? Five minutes and then wrap up, and you will get the recording, Vish. Thank you for joining. Yeah, thank you for your This was wonderful. I'm so excited for the subsequent sessions. Me thank too. You. Great. Have good, happy meetings. <laughs> See you all. My final question on this particular topic, because it's it came up in the second episode, and I don't believe it comes up again, or at least I don't remember it coming up. Cam might know, is this whole idea of axial revolution mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how that kind of changed the world stage, et cetera. It's a bit of a distraction. It could be very profound. Um, I was looking into it, uh, going through some Wikipedia pages and all that stuff. And in general, I think I got it, but I wasn't sure about the thesis of what made it axial revolution. Uh, other, other, than, other than my understanding was, correct me if I'm wrong, that in about 500 years time span, you had rise of Christianity, Judaism, Hindu, Vedanta, and Buddhism, mm -hmm. and Lao Tung, like you know, the Chinese philosophers. So these major civilizations and their key thinkers uh, and the key philosophies were born within 500 years uh, span, and and including, of course, the Greeks, um, which we go into quite mm -hmm. some detail. All of those came about the same time, and that somehow was the axial revolution. I'm still trying to figure out what is the common thread across all of them. Well, I, let me tell you what I th I think he's trying to aim at there, is that what the axial revolution did is it shifted the 
quote, you know, philosophical, you can say religious philosophical in the same thing, I think. And what it did is it helped us be aware of our... I don't think you can, but what, carry on. That? Oh, I, would, well, I, would not, I would not equivocate between philosophy and religion. Really, I do. But okay, we can talk about that later. But I don't think there's any difference, really. Um, oh, fundamentally, if they're handled properly, and not too left brain oriented. But that's maybe another thing. But this is what I understood what it did, was it made humans aware. Uh, it was like a psychotechnology of the fact that we are not just impulsive creatures that should let ourselves just run ape shit wild. And, you know, there's violence, there's suffering, but it's nothing to do with me. And he says, what it did is it, 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 it made the people realize it actually has everything to do with me. And that my job is to orient myself through these practices that were being developed in the actual evolution to be able to be someone that um, can reorient my behavior and my perception to be someone that actually creates nonviolence and harmony and advancement and goodness uh, through my own self-examination. That's that in my own self um, awareness and examination and my practices towards a better uh, being of person. I think that to that's you, my that, that to you. That's the that's the part that's axial. That's the part yes. connects across. That's that's what I think is that was fundamental through all of those practices. I see. And fundamental in the shift. And I think part of it had to do with the fact that we were more social in large groups. And you can't just be, you know, you can't just attack people randomly. Or, or steal their stuff or try to rape their women without this creating a problem that is actually bad for everybody. So there's a shift from... Um, Ken, any, any reflections from you, Ken? Uh, the only thing that's really dawning on me is my opening comments on the invention of the alphabetical language mm -hmm. and the, the, the literacy. I mean, the, the, the power that that affords whoever wields it is is really we take it for granted but it's enormous and that Huge. the rapage the raping and pillaging is continues up to this day you guys like the running across the globe has been non-stop but it's for, less than it used to be overall though it it's I'm not entirely convinced of that well you know it's have you read That's, Steven Pinker's work at all? I mean, are you familiar? Uh, yeah, with I'm familiar with Pinker's work. And I'm there's I'm also familiar with what goes on in cyberspace in a in a as a consequence of my professional domain. Mm -hmm. And there's some there is some pretty hideous stuff going on in the world today that's the same thing. It's because because you have a technology that is new and enormously powerful mm -hmm. and you're going to have highly intelligent people who are that are going to act i mean i literally had a cybersecurity guy telling me like an expert telling me using the phrase bad actors mm -hmm. we're, we're 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 getting to the point where we can we can weed out these bad actors that would be nice and that's been going on now for probably over a decade at this point Mm -hmm. so you so sure pinker's right about a lot of things like i'm not gonna fight with his with the data that he puts forth <laughs> and and those around him but at the same time they're they're still playing they're still looking at history like they're catching up pinker they're they don't they're not living and breathing the way that like fbi agents are living and breathing today like it's well, so it's it's there's a I don't want to, I just don't want to, I'm, maybe you're right. Maybe it's all, maybe it's all done and we've seen the worst of it. I, I'm a little bit skeptical. Well, it's not, for me, it's not that we've, we, that we're not going to see horrific things. It's about the, uh, about the trend over time. So you. So this right? one is worth, uh, we can put a pin on this. This is going away, but I'm familiar with better, uh, better nature of our angels work by Pinker. And uh, but there's a very strong rebuttal, and some of the data behind that particular book has been contested by Nassim Taleb, and mm -hmm. uh, we can get into a side conversation not relevant to our wiki around that. Um, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a it's an interesting subject, but it's also important to consider the fact that that psych psychopaths, sociopaths, you know, the the dark triad. Yeah. represent a very small percentage of the population, but they are exponentially destructive. 
That's true. So part of what's happened in the modern world is that the internet has allowed those people to run ape shit wild with no consequences. Where if you take a sociopath and you put them into a tight group, they get thrown out really quick yes. because they get caught. Yes. And then people are like, you're out of here, motherfucker. Like we don't, or they kill them or they, or they jail them or they, or they expel them. And in the modern world, we still haven't figured out how to sort them out. I mean, you know, basically 20% of the content online is, is I mean, 80% is produced by 20% of the users and a large percentage of those users are sociopaths because they're so thrilled they can run ape shit, abuse people with no consequences, where if they did that to people's faces, they would be, they'd be put down pretty quick. Um, I think that's something worth considering. So should we end on that happy note? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, really. That's a cheerful social note. Uh, so so uh, I was going to just say, well, next time we'll cover the next two uh, chapters, uh, session number, episode number three and four. And uh, I found this very enjoyable. And I find actually the minor diversions into adjacent topics very delightful. So I don't think we need to quote, quote unquote, stay on script. Yeah, my rule of thumb is if you're broadly on script and we have fun with that, that's good enough. Uh, this is not a school exam, so it's all fine. If we, <laughs> if we bring in all sorts of different topics, Cam and Michael and Vish, if, I was, if he's listening, we should confirm that. I agree. And I also, I, I also really appreciate the exchange of ideas and even the challenges, because that's what I'm looking for. I don't, I'm not actually looking for people to agree. I'm looking for a way to refine, a reflection to ref, use to refine my view to hopefully be more on target, right? That's the point. Me it's too. Not, not I would me. Welcome, uh, upon reflection, we don't have to capture it on camera. Upon reflection, if um, any of you, including Vish, have any suggestions on how we might either change the rules of this discussion or, mm -hmm. or whatever. Because the goal is we are just getting warmed up and we want to have a dynamic which allows us to you know, grow together. So um, I'm just trying to play the role of a little bit, 10% moderation, but I don't want to be the one doing it. So you tell me if we need to course correct. I think we should get together and wrestle. <laughs> that would be, I wish we I could. You would say that. Are you guys <laughs> all? Are you guys all? Are you all close to one another down there? Relatively speaking, You're not too close. I mean, Vish and 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 Anu are, are closer than well, I, I'm about an hour and we, a half drive. We could, we could that's still plan, pretty close. Plan something. So if I come down the there, we can. Yeah, we, so I think, I think gonna, we should put that on the calendar. I, I think, think we should. Meet. I think we should find a time. Oh yeah. And we should just have a WrestleMania. November. And yeah. then. I agree. I, I would be thrilled. I mean, I, I really, you know, wish everyone was like two blocks away. That would be even better. So, okay. All right. Thank Thanks. you so much. And um, I'm going to pause the recording.